Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church Online. You'll notice we're inside this week because it's a little smoky outside. It's been a interesting week if you're on the West Coast, anywhere from about mid-California up to the Canadian border. Uh, you've probably been impacted or aware of the fires that have been taking place. And I know for some, as they see all of this on top of the pandemic and other things, and they wrestle with the question, where's God in the midst of all of this? Uh, big question um, that would take more time than we have this morning to answer in detail, other than to say, at least for myself, I've seen evidences of God's hand at work in the midst of the 14 firefighters who, because of the shifting winds, found themselves surrounded by flames uh, at the point where they had to deploy their, their safety tent, which is their last ditch effort uh, to try to survive, and they did. Um, one of them is still in serious condition, but, but all made it through. Um, I see God's hand at work in the midst of the filming that I've seen of individuals driving down the road with, with flaming trees on both sides of them and limbs um, uh, flaming, blanding on their vehicle as they drive. One particular individual described it as driving through hell, which is a little bit what it looked like, and yet they survived. Um, God's hand, I believe, has been uh, clearly at work uh, around us, even in the midst of these challenging moments. But despite all of that, um, we know that God is good. In fact, we know that God is good all the time. As the saying says, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And so how do we continue to put our faith and trust in God when circumstances uh, seem to be so chaotic? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in our service this morning. Uh, but before we do that, we want to take some time just to thank God. Thank God for his hand of provision on those 14 firefighters. Thank God for how he has protected so many others, um, some of who waited till the last minute to be able to get out and yet did escape. I thank God, even apart from those, for simply who he is, uh, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. So we're going to do that through a little bit of singing, a little bit of praying uh, this morning. And we're going to start off with one of the great hymns of the faith, uh, Fairest Lord Jesus. And so if you would um, listen to the words in particular, uh, listen to the tune, sing along. You'll know the melody as it goes, uh, but prepare your heart to this day for what God has in store for us. The will I change.
One of the things I love about uh, the more traditional hymns is just the depth uh, of the meaning behind the words. Uh, one of the, the lyrics in that song we've just sung said, Praise, adoration, now, forevermore, be thine. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to worship and to thank and to praise God. We do that easily when we understand His hand uh, at work around us. Sometimes it's more of a challenge uh, when we don't see things with the clarity that we would like. Uh, but whether clear or not, we're still called to praise and to thank God. And so we do that through singing, but we also do that as we come before Him in prayer. And so we're going to shift gears for just a moment this morning, uh, going to God in a time of prayer. Um, I'm going to start with an introduction, and then I'm going to pause for a moment uh, to let you pray. You may know, as many of us do, individuals, uh, friends, family, co-workers who have been impacted by these fires. Um, maybe they've lost a home, maybe they've lost a cabin, um, whatever it might be. So I'm going to pause to allow you to lift up those that you know specifically, and then I'll continue us on, on today. But with that, um, let me invite you to bow with me as we spend a few moments in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Well, gracious and holy Father, as we think of the, the lyrics of the song, praise, adoration, uh, God, we're to to lift up our hearts and voices in appreciation to you um, all of the time. Uh, there are times when that's easy, God, because we just see your hand so at work in our midst. There's other times when that's a bit of a challenge for us. And yet even when we can't see it, we know that you're there. Uh, even, Father, if it's not quite as visible at, at, as at other moments, we know that you are in the midst of that. And so we begin by saying thank you, God. Uh, thank you for uh, all that you do. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the way that you've been present, even in the midst of these fires and, and protecting uh, so many lives that could easily have been lost. But even putting that aside, thank you for just who you are. Uh, the, the one uh, Father who loves us more than we can imagine, the one who by definition is the presence of love, the one who creates and sustains the universe. Um, God, we love you. And, um, and we just want to say that. As we move into our time of praying for some specific needs, God, we, we pause for just a moment individually to think of, of things that might be weighing on our hearts. Specifically, we think of those that have been impacted by the fires up and down the coast. And so, uh, God, hear our prayers as they come from our hearts for just a few moments of those that we know who find themselves aching this day.
Uh, Lord, as we think of some of those individuals, I know even within our church, um, God, we have people who have been impacted and loss of, of property um, for some of us, my own family included. We have uh, individuals uh, with and co-workers who have lost their homes. Others have lost businesses. Um, God, we know that this is a difficult time for them, and so we pray your comfort. Uh, Lord, for those that are, are just trying to cope with the shock of the suddenness all of all of this, we pray, Lord, that you would surround them with those that can help guide them through this time. Father, for those nights when they uh, lay in bed and their minds are just racing about what's going to take place next, we pray a, a supernatural sense of peace for them. And Father, I, I pray that you would use us um, as the church, but also as friends and family uh, to come alongside um, and to be a sense of, of reassurance in the midst of the, the struggles, the difficulties, uh, the hard times these individuals are going through. We're mindful, Lord, that it's continuing on, uh, that these fires are probably going to go for a, a while yet. And so we ask continued protection uh, for those that might yet be in the path of some of these fires. We pray for the firefighters, Lord, that you would watch over them, that you would um, uh, allow your, your angels to stand guard about them, that you'd grant them wisdom to know how to best deal with these uh, fires in order to, to minimize risk as well as loss. And um, God, we just ask that your hand would be present there. Beyond that, there are other things taking place, Lord. Um, God, we think of, of some in our church family that continue on on the road to recovery from um, some uh, surgeries that they've had as of late. We continue to pray, Lord, for Trudy and ask that you would be with her as she recovers from a procedure this past week. We ask that you would allow your healing presence to continue to, to rest upon Marcy. Lord, as her body gets adjusted to this new uh, liver, that everything would go smoothly in that. Father, we think of uh, Barbara Poole, um, a wonderful saint of uh, 94 years who's dealing with, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, God, we ask that your hand would rest upon her. Um, God, protect her from uh, some of the, um, the byproducts that, that this virus can result in. And we pray also, Lord, uh, for her husband, Gail, that for both of them and, and all of them and their residents at Redwood Heights, um, that you would watch over them at this time. Father, for our church, God, we just ask that you would uh, be with those who uh, call Calvary their home. It's, it's interesting times and not being able to get together in the ways that we would like. And yet we rejoice in the knowledge that we are united, that we're bound together uh, by something that's far greater than, than being in the physical proximity of one another. That is that we're bound by faith, we're bound by heart. And so may we continue to remember one another in these times of, of for the most part, physical separation. Uh, God, on a daily basis, may we continue to bring before you uh, those that you bring to our hearts and minds. Be with us now, God, as we spend some time in your word, as we think about yet another assurance that you give to us, one of those promises that we can hold on to. May this provide for us strength and comfort in these challenging days, but in every day of our life as well. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to spend some time in God's Word today. Always a good thing to do. I hope you do this, not just on Sundays. Um, God's Word's always available to us. If by chance you don't have a copy of the Bible, um, stop by the church. We would be happy to get one to you. And if you're watching this from somewhere outside of the Salem area, uh, send us a note. We would be happy to mail you a copy of God's Word. Everybody should have a, a Bible in their home. Well, this morning we're going to continue on in our examination of the book of Psalms, and, and we do that as, as uh, sort of a follow-up just to this time in which we find ourselves. Fires here in, in Salem, uh, pandemic, civil unrest, all these kinds of things uh, uh, make for a very... Um, a confusing, chaotic, interesting uh, period. And yet, as Christians, uh, we're told that even in the midst of uh, some of the most adverse circumstances, we're to be a people of joy. So how do we find that joy even when uh, the challenges surround us? Well, uh, we've been trying to take a look at that in recent weeks as we have found ourselves in this series, Blessed Assurance, in which we have been uh, taking an examination of uh, some of the writings of uh, the, the book of 
Psalms and drawing out of that uh, promises, um, illustrations of God's uh, qualities and characteristics that help us know that even in the midst of the most challenging moments, there's hope and that hope is found in God. And so we're going to continue on in that, that sort of theme, that tenor today, uh, as we look at Psalm 42. If you've got your Bibles, please take time to look at that. We'll cover a lot of it in, uh, in our readings and in our slides, but won't get to quite all of it, so you might want to follow along in your own Bible. Uh, some of the assurances that we've already taken a look at thus far are just those ideas that of knowing that God is present with us, of knowing that we matter to God, of, of being aware of the fact that we can find comfort even in seasons of uncertainty. And today, uh, sort of our theme, our emphasis is on this idea, this assurance that God is faithful all all the time. Um, again, we're going to do that as we look at Psalm 42. And if you by chance have your Bible, you notice probably at the very top there underneath, uh, you'll see the, the word that it's a mascal. Uh, now that word mascal is simply a um, musical notation that means this is important. You need to pay attention to this. Uh, sometimes referred to as teaching psalms, uh, but it's a way of, of drawing special attention to what's going to be found in the text. I also see that it, it says that it's uh, of, the, of the sons of Korah, which is just a way of, of pointing out that uh, this family, the family of Korah, were the ones that were probably going to lead in the singing. Um, sometimes churches have families that just enjoy praising and worshiping God. I think of the Ulmer family in our church here at Calvary and, and how they pull their voices together. Well, that's the same idea of what was taking place in this particular psalm. And then we see, uh, finally, that it's probably a, a psalm of David. Uh, tradition holds that this was uh, probably written in terms of the words by David with the musical accompaniment being provided by the sons of Korah. So um, as we go through this, uh, think of that idea of it uh, being written by David. Uh, again, the tradition is that this was written during a time where David is on the run. He's being pursued by his own son, a tragic as that is, who is seeking to overthrow him, actually seeking to kill him so that he can uh, take over the throne. And so for, for David, this is a time where he's been removed from the throne, his life is threatened, he's on the run, um, and many of his friends have kind of bailed out on him. And in, in some ways, um, uh, this could be seen maybe as the low point in his life. And so it's interesting to see what he has to say at this particular period. We begin by the, the psalm by looking at the first two verses, and sort of the, the theme that we draw out of that is this idea uh, that as individuals, um, even in challenging moments, uh, we're to yearn for God, we're to long for Him. And the imagery uh, that David gives us here is not only poetic, but it's just beautiful. Listen to what it is that, that David writes there in Psalm 42, the first two verses. Uh, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? I don't know a lot about deer. I grew up in Southern California in a suburb of, of Los Angeles, and there just aren't a lot of deer and elk running around the streets of L.A. But I grew up in a household with a dad and a grandpa that knew a lot about deer because they liked to hunt, especially my grandfather. And so I'd hear stories about them uh, going out throughout their lives. And one of the things that I recall about deer is that they have this, this propensity to be, to be drawn to water. Um, sometimes they're drawn to water because they're thirsty, uh, that's certainly understandable, but they'd also be drawn to water if they were injured or if they were um, exhausted from running, they would try to find their way uh, toward water. Uh, apparently among the hunter circles, there's a variety of, of uh, theories that go along with this. Uh, maybe there's a clotting factor with the cold water if the deer's injured. Uh, sometimes it when they're exhausted, they just are seeking hydration, and so it would draw them to that. But for whatever reason, it appears that deer uh, lean toward or, or find themselves drawn toward water more than just wanting it. Instinctively, they almost can't control themselves. They're, they're just compelled to go toward water. In the same way, uh, David uh, reminds us or um, encourages us uh, to be a, a people who should find our own spirits drawn toward God, compelled toward a God. Um, and I think that's true. I, I think we see that happen 
kind of like deer, um, when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances or challenging times. Uh, there's long been the saying in military circles, there are no atheists in foxholes. The idea being that when you've got those bullets peppering the rock right above your head, um, that there's just this built-in part of us that's hardwired to, to cry out to God is a part of that. I think for others of us, uh, you think of these circumstances with the fire as the, as the trees are bursting into flame. Um, some of the people I've heard on the news uh, talked about how they were praying as they were driving down the road. Now, maybe they pray all the time anyway, I don't know, but I suspect there was a little added urgency as a part of that. We just find that, that when we are drawn to those moments or in the midst of those moments where, where life is difficult, that we, we uh, are, are called into that idea of, of turning toward God. In verse 2 here, uh, David write that is the, kind of with that idea that the deer can't wait to quench its thirst. Well, for our souls, I think there's that idea that it's, it's yearning to have its needs quenched by God as well. As we think about that idea of, of, of quenching our thirst, you know, for most of us, it's probably been a long time since we have been really, really, really thirsty. Uh, we just have too much available, uh, availability to things today. We can get soft drinks at a, a gas station or a convenience store. Most of us have got bottles of water at home. There's drinking fountains almost everywhere you go. There's just all kinds of availability to that. But I want you to think for a moment of a time in your life when you were really thirsty. Uh, parched uh, is a word that comes to mind. Uh, for myself, uh, the last time I can think of being really, really thirsty was a number of years ago when I took a mission trip uh, to Mali, Africa. Mali is a pretty desolate uh, country, um, very poor at that time. It was the third poorest country in the world, and, um, and there's not much that's there. In fact, there's not even a lot of, of shrubbery uh, around the side of the roads because they've taken it all and used it for fuel and, and burned it. And so we found ourselves on this road. We were going from uh, village to village. It was going to be a two or three hour uh, drive. We were being um, escorted or driven by a couple of pastors that were uh, serving as our guides. And it just so happened that as we had gotten into the vehicle, that each one of these pastors thought the other one had brought some water for us. Uh, so the result was we had no water. Now, I don't know if I would have thought I was thirsty at all um, if it hadn't been for the fact that I knew that we didn't have water. But you know how that works? Once you realize you don't have it, that's when you really want it. Um, and in addition to that, there was the, the reality that it was very hot out. Uh, we were in sort of an open-topped kind of Jeep type of vehicle. There's dust everywhere because the roads are very primitive. Your mouth starts to get in that kind of cotton mouth uh, feeling. And I was just, uh, parched would be the word that comes to mind. I was so thirsty. I uh, began to feel it at, a, at about a half hour, but by the end of two hours, um, I was just uh, felt like I was dying. Now, in, in Mali, you can't just stop anywhere and get water because um, you don't want to drink most of the water. The consequences of that would be even worse uh, than, than being parched. Um, what you have to do is you have to wait till you can find a motel or something that caters to Western visitors where they would have safe water to drink. Or if you can find a, a store, they've probably got Coca-Cola, which was safe to drink as well. And finally, after a couple hours, we, we finally got to that place where uh, we, we were able to get that and, and there was relief there. Well, it's, it's that same um, yearning, that same longing, that same parched feeling uh, that I had for water that, that David says we should have toward God. That there should just be this craving uh, for God to be a, a part of of our lives. Um, and it wasn't just David that had that feeling as well. We read in, in the book of Isaiah, the, the 26th chapter, these words, my soul yearns for you in the night and in the morning, my spirit longs for you. And as we do that, we know that we'll find relief because we know who provides relief from that thirst. And how do we know that? Well, Scripture tells us in the book of John, the 7th chapter, the 37th verse, Jesus himself uh, says these words, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And so as we have that, that longing, that craving, that yearning, that parched feeling, um, we know that God is the one that we can turn to and find that sense of relief. 
Uh, so we start with that I idea that um, that we need to long for God. Uh, David goes on then in, in, in the next uh, verse by saying that we need to be honest with God. In verse 3 of Psalm 42, we read this. My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Going down to verse 7. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me, which is just sort of a poetic way of saying he felt like he was drowning. In verse 9, I, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed uh, by the enemy and so forth? And we see in these, and what I appreciate is David's willingness to be candid. Again, life's not great for him at the moment. He's, he's on the run, his son's trying to, to kill him. It's a, it's a, it's a tough time. And, and rather than just uh, kind of paint over that, uh, David chooses to be open and honest with God. Now, if this idea of being honest with God sounds familiar, uh, it's because we saw the same thing a, a couple of weeks ago in Psalm 10. Uh, so why do we see the psalmist, why is David repeating this idea? Why is he saying the same thing over uh, again? Well, because sometimes we need to hear the same thing over again. For those of you that uh, have children or maybe nieces or nephews or can remember in your own life, I wonder how many times as your kids were growing up, did you have to remind them to brush their teeth? In my particular family, uh, for my girls, I figure 365 days a year, they were at home, say, roughly 18 years. So whatever 18 times 365, that would be the number of times we had to remind our girls to brush their teeth. They knew they should do it. They knew it wasn't going to hurt. It just was one of those things we had to constantly remind them of. Uh, sometimes God has to remind us of certain truths over and over again as well. One of those is this idea of, of being honest. Being honest with God, maybe even being honest with one another. And why is it that we have so much trouble being honest? Well, and I say this in the kindest Tone. Uh, the truth is that I think for too many of us, we've learned to be fake. Um, we mentioned last uh, or a couple weeks ago when we talked about this, that you walk into the church and you say hi to people and how are you doing? And everybody says, fine, good. But it's not just the church. Uh, you, you go out on the street, take a walk. Uh, somebody passes you by, maybe a neighbor. You ask how they're doing, same kind of response. You, you run into somebody in the supermarket, same kind of, of response. Uh, we just seem to, to sort of point toward that idea of, of everything being fine and okay. Uh, we're not really very transparent in things. Why do we do that? Well, I think it's uh, because of some things that we've learned over the years. One of those things being that we realize people don't want to probably know every detail of our lives. Um, I suspect all of us have run into that person where you ask how they're doing and they tell you to the minute of what's been happening in their lives and yet you, you don't want to be that person necessarily. And the truth is that, that even for myself, when I ask somebody how they're doing, I really am not necessarily interested if they burnt the fish sticks last night, or I don't care if they've got a hangnail today, or if there is a gopher in their yard. Um, but I do care if they've heard as a result of a routine test that there's a mass now that the doctors want to do some follow-up work on. I do care if they have a child that they're really concerned about because they seem to be consistently making some really bad life choices. I do care if the individual works at a restaurant that's just barely getting by and really uh, this person is wondering if their job is, is going to be around much longer. Folks, we do care um, about those things that are significant. Another reason I think we, we tend not to be so transparent is, is because we're afraid that if we're, we're too honest, it'll be used against us. Um, you know, if we get to that point of being vulnerable, um, maybe uh, the boss won't give us the raise because of something that we said or revealed. Maybe a coworker will use something they know about us to, to get the position that we were uh, aspiring for, uh, for. We just know that individuals sometimes will take those things and use them in ways that they were not intended. And when it comes to God, I think sometimes that maybe we're not as transparent uh, as, as we should be as well. To be quite honest, we're embarrassed. We're embarrassed because we have done something again that we know is not pleasing to God's will. And it's not the first time or the second time or the tenth time. Um, 
And so we just feel this, this sense of shame as a result of that. And yet, despite that, we need to be transparent, especially with God. We need to be willing to speak the truth. David did this with, with very blunt candidness as he's talking to God. I don't understand, God, why you're not present here. I don't understand why uh, you just sit back while all of these people are, are making fun of me. We need to be honest with God. We need to do that because he cares about us more than we can possibly know. In fact, he loves us. Even if it seems like nobody else out there does, God does uh, we need to do that because he wants to hear from us. Over and over we read in scripture that he, he wants to, he, to hear from our mouths the joys as well as the challenges uh, of the things that we're experiencing. Uh, and we need to be honest with God because, as we mentioned a few weeks ago, we're not going to fool God. Uh, no matter what we say, no matter what we try to think in our mind, he knows our hearts, he knows our minds, he knows uh, the truth that's going to be found in there. And so we need to be a people who, who thirst after God. We need to yearn for God. We need to be individuals who are, are honest with God. Thirdly, we see that David talks about this idea that we need to remember God's faithfulness. We need to remember God's faithfulness. He writes this in verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. And then as you go to verse 6, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember I remember, I remember. Uh, and, and you sense in this that David's being deliberate about this, about almost forcing himself to recall uh, the things of, of God that have happened in the past. Because he probably realized, as you and I know, that it's very easy for us to lose sight of that when we get caught up in the moment. The things that are going on, the activity, the hecticness, the chaos, the emotions, all of those can, can distract us um, from remembering what, what actually has happened in the past. I think, for example, uh, of, a, of the situation where if, if something's happened um, and the stock market has taken a plunge, uh, maybe for several days, even a week, inevitably you'll see an expert get on the, the news channel and say, hey, don't panic, don't worry, things are going to work out, don't sell all of your stock. Because we just become so tunnel visioned, we, we lose uh, a sense of the bigger picture. David held on to that bigger picture because he was deliberate about that. He forced himself uh, to remember God's faithfulness, and, and I think we're called to do the same things. And what is it that David remembered? Well, um, uh, we see that he remembered that, that he was thirsting for a living God. He knew that God wasn't dead. God wasn't asleep. God hadn't taken a vacation. God was still there and was still there for him. Uh, he, he remembered the, the, the sweetness of, of corporate worship in, in that fourth verse. It talks about uh, being with others with shouts of joy and of praise. Uh, we're in a time in the life of the church where we don't get to do that in the way that we like. I think we yearn for that, talking about that. But we also remember part of what the yearning is, is we want to be able to return, hopefully before too long, uh, to that moment where we together can uh, sing and praise God to our heart's content. A third thing that, that he remembers is uh, that sense of, of, of fellowship. He talks about the festive throng that was there. Uh, we miss that as well. Um, for some of us, we're able to be here on Sunday mornings and, and we can say hello from a distance, but we don't shake hands. We don't uh, give hugs uh, to one another. We make sure we honor that, that social distancing piece. And, and while it's still good to see one another, I'm, I'm glad we can do that. It's not the same. David remembered how there had been those moments before he found himself on the run. And finally, we see that David remembered that God loved him. In verse 8, it says, by the day God directs his love. He is the definition of love again. And so David, in the midst of all that's happening around him, held on to each one of those pieces. Now, as we remember, there may be different things for us that are a part of our list. But what I can assure you is that there is a list. There are things that we can look back to over the days and the weeks and the years that, if we're deliberate about it, uh, will help us to recall God's faithfulness, His presence, His persistence, His provision with us uh, throughout the various seasons of our life. Uh, so, as we look to this 42nd Psalm and think about the faithfulness of God, we, we discover that we're to yearn for Him, that we're to be honest with Him, that we're to remember His faithfulness, and that uh, finally uh, we're to put our faith in this God who is like that. 
Hey, it's interesting in verses 5 and 11 of Psalm 42, we see the exact same words used. In fact, uh, these same words are used in Psalm 43 at one point as well. And, and these words are as follows. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Uh, there's an interesting book written by a gentleman named Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's taught, entitled Spiritual Depression. And, and in this book, one of the things he writes is this. The main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to yourself, why are you downcast? What business have you to be disquieted? And this isn't to say that we take the place of God. We, we acknowledge that, that God is the one that ultimately we turn to. But, but I think what he's trying to point out here is the importance of us taking responsibility for ourselves. Uh, we're all aware that we live in a, in a day and an age in which there are some problems around us, um, and many people are, are willing to get some help in that. In fact, I came across a statistic that said 42% of adults have sought out at some time in their life counseling or, or some kind of mental health uh, assistance. And yet one of the things that we know as time has gone on is that in more recent years, uh, what people are looking for are, is they want others to fix their problems rather than wrestling through or working through uh, the issues themselves. Uh, they, they want things to be better, but they don't want to invest the hard work on their own. Uh, we see here that, that David isn't been afraid to confront some of the difficult questions. He says, why have you forgotten me? Uh, why must I go in, into mourning? My bones suffer, suffer agony. And yet at the end of all of that, he goes back to that idea that God is there for him, that he can turn uh, to God. David say, says to himself, in essence, self, even though you're depressed, it's time to trust God. And that's not always an easy thing to do. It, it takes an element of, of determination. It takes an element of courage uh, to be willing to move that direction. And yet, I think the call from God is that we would each do that, uh, that we would focus our attention, we would remember the things of the past, and take that step of trusting that God is going to get us through. Get us through the season, even when we uh, wonder how we're going to make it to the end of the day. God will be there with us. Um, David says, I'm not going to praise God. Uh, he says, I'm going to praise God even though I don't feel like it. I'm going to trust his character. He's God and I'm not. He loves me and therefore I can put my hope in him uh, knowing that what he does is right, knowing that what he does is ultimately good. And so my, my hope is as we, we move uh, past this and, and get ready for what God has for us next week, that as we think back about this 42nd Psalm, that we'll, we'll take with us that idea that God is faithful in our lives and is deserving of our hope, of our trust, of our faith. In just a moment, we're going to sing a, a closing song entitled, uh, But For Your Grace. And it reminds us that, but for the grace of God, we could be overwhelmed. Uh, we could feel um, um, simply uh, swamped by the, the hardships and the discouragement, the despondency, the, the despair. Folks, I'm not saying life isn't tough. It is tough. But what we're reminded of through David's words, and I hope through uh, the words of this song, through Jesus' words, the words of the prophets and, and the apostles, and through our own life experiences, is that we can, we will get through this with God's help. That God hasn't forgotten or abandoned us, that he is there beside us, undergirding, strengthening, empowering, sustaining, even when we don't necessarily say or see it or feel it. So may we put our trust in God and look to his grace. May we be assured by the reality that God is, has always been, and will always be there for us. In the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter, the 33rd verse, Jesus said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. May that be a promise, may that be a word of assurance for you this day, this season, 
as we trust and look to God each and every day. Amen. Well, I hope you uh, found that song as encouraging uh, to your soul and spirit as I did. We're going to wrap up in a word of prayer in just a moment. Um, as we do that, let me encourage you to continue to remember those that have been impacted uh, by the fires uh, as of late. As we've talked about with the explosion in Beirut, uh, life is going to go on. There's going to be another news story that's going to capture our attention. Uh, but for those that have lost homes, who have lost businesses, maybe even a loved one, uh, folks, uh, the, the, the challenge is just beginning for them. And so may we remember them this day and in the weeks ahead. With that, uh, thank you for joining with us this day. I do hope you have a good week coming up. And if you'll bow with me, we'll close in a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for uh, these words of encouragement in the midst of... Um, a difficult week. God, how we uh, lean on and trust in and find um, reassurance in the, in the words of David, who was no stranger to tough moments, to discouraging times, to difficult seasons. And yet, as we look to his life, may we find in our own spirits uh, a sense of hope, uh, a, um, an acknowledgement, Father, 
that as you were with him and as you have been with us in the past, so you'll be with us this day and this week and in the months ahead. We do, uh, again, Lord, think of all of those whose lives have been um, turned upside down by the fires. We ask your comfort, your peace upon them. What's more, we would pray for those that continue to fight the fires uh, throughout various states. Uh, might you watch over them in the way that you alone can do. Thank you once again for this time to be in your presence. Thank you once again simply for who you are. Use us, God, uh, in whatever way you deem best in this coming week. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.